Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Cleveland Heights University Heights March 31st special meeting. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, would you please call the roll? Mr. Frick. Here. Mr. Posh? Here. Mr. Hennings? Here. Ms. Serini? Here. Ms. Lewis? Ms. Lewis won't be joining us this evening. She is uh, traveling with her children and was unable to make this, uh, this meeting. In our retreat on Saturday, the board felt it was important that we get a reopening update. Uh, that's the first item on our agenda. Uh, Ms. Kirby, would you um, give us your presentation, please? Yes, I will do that. Let me begin presenting. Can everyone see that? Can someone say yes? I don't know. Yeah, you... we can see it, Liz. Yes, Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, I just have um, a brief presentation to share with everyone where we are as we prepare to offer a five day a week model um, in April when we return from spring break. Um, so just as a general uh, information, we did conclude our, our third quarter on March 26th. We also closed out our selection surveys on March 29th so that we were clear on what the intentions of all of our families are for the fourth quarter. Um, we start the model adoption for the five day a week model. Um, April 6th, that five day a week model will start for our MD and AU students, our option students and our CTE students. For April 12th, um, that five-day model option will start for our students in grades K to 12, um, and our pre-K students will maintain the same schedule. We've continued um, our planning with our um, elementary school team, the secondary school teams, our reopening teams, um, administrative teams, very similar process that we engaged in when we moved from remote to hybrid. Um, we also have um, received feedback both in those meetings and also in some parent meetings on um, on summer planning needs. So both from the reopening committees and also the parent group um, received some feedback on that. Um, we have requested rapid testing kits for families and staff. This is an opportunity that the Ohio Department of Public Health has offered. Um, and we enthusiastically um, uh, took them up on the offer. And we are working with the OS, the ESC, the Board of Health and the Metro Health just on the, lo the logistics of these rapid testing kits. Um, shortly, those, those kits are used for families, so families can, um, you know, test their students, um, you know, at home, and then there's a process of, um, you know, looking at the test results, and there's some, there's uh, some technical pieces of reporting those test results out to the company that provides the rapid testing, but there's a webinar that will come to that. We're actually um, in contact with the ESC to pick those tests up this week so we can have those available. Um, we are also exploring an opportunity to provide these kits for the community as well. My understanding is that um, there is there may be some additional availability, so we're trying to see if we can offer this as a community resource um, for community members who want access to the rapid testing kits. So we will provide um, updates and information um, in our, our regular cadence of communication that we send out to our families and stakeholders. Um, this second slide just revisits the fourth quarter model option, so I won't spend any time on this. People have seen, um, seen the slide before. Um, in terms of the county risk level with the health advisory, um, this is as of March 25th of last week. Um, we still remain in red for, for Cuyahoga County, and you see there um, how the other areas are doing um, across the state as it relates to COVID spread. If you've been watching even the national news, you're, there's a, a plateau that's been re that's been referenced as people get vaccines, and there's you know maybe a little um, uh, laxness happening in terms of some of the mask uh, compliance pieces that we know are really important to prevent spreads. So that's like messaging that we're seeing in the state of Ohio, but also nationally too, as well. This next slide just gives the information on uh, the spread in the counties and kind of to the point I just made, you see a plateauing, a bit of a plateauing um, in terms of the number of cases in the county. Um, though there has definitely been an increase in the percentage of people who have, 
who have um, been vaccinated and have access to the vaccines. So I wanted to just quickly go over where we stand with the model selection. Um, and interestingly, as we anticipated, um, even from the, the interest survey, that information really aligns uh, pretty tightly to what families actually selected when we actually had to make their choice. So from our um, elementary school families, 73% um, of those families have indicated they want to have their, their child attend five days a week. We have about 27% who prefer the remote option. Uh, for our families in grades six to eight, um, again, we have similar to what we had before, a little over 50% that want the five day a week. We have about 14% that would like to maintain the hybrid model, and then about 30% who would like to remain remote. And on the high school side, 35% uh, who would like five days a week, 18.7% who would like to maintain the remote model, and then about 46% would like to remain fully remote. And this, this does align uh, to what we've been seeing since we started collecting this information for the fourth quarter. So now that we're going into a five-day model, there are some operational, operational changes that we have to attend to. So the team has been out working with um, principals, visiting schools, making sure that we have the distancing in place for uh, classrooms, no less than three feet of separation, uh, lunchrooms, no less than six feet of separation. This is definitely involved moving uh, furniture from building to building, make, you know, doing some coordination around some pieces in the school. It's been really you know, important to also get the final uh, selection surveys as well. Um, we also um, have heard that there have been um, some clarification needed on the use of cleaning supplies in our classroom. So, um, it's been helpful to hear that feedback, and we'll make sure as we continue to communicate what can be used by who, that um, it's clearly communicated, and it also complies with um, guidance from the Board of Health and other health professionals as well. You know, the thing that we continue to emphasize is the masking is really, really important, um, you know, in the classrooms. And there's definitely a, a desire that I understand that people think that everything needs to be wiped down constantly at all times. Um, but actually the most important piece, and you'll hear this again and again, is uh, that the masking and the social distancing pieces. So, so we'll also clarify that. In terms of food, uh, and, and I do wanna share, um, you know, some of the feedback that we received has was helpful also, and I shared similar feedback with my colleagues in the first ring, you know, just to make sure that that was something that was on their radars too, as well. So in terms of food service, um, at the elementary schools, we will have um, breakfast um, offered to kids on Mondays to take home for the entire week. So we're trying to really cut down on the opportunities um, where kids will have to kind of take their mask off, you know, and, you know, the safety pieces. So the breakfasts will, we will distribute as we have been distributing during hybrid where the students take their, take um, them home and then they can have breakfast at home before they come to school. Um, but we'll always still have supplemental breakfast offered for students who may not have an opportunity to eat um, before they come to school. Hot lunch is served daily, and then we'll also offer the weekend meals. Um, we'll have a remote, uh, remote pickups Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for students. Um, and we do those, you know, again, kind of as group meals. So we will give bags of meals that go over several days for families. Um, and in terms of uh, the hybrid learners, uh, they will have uh, breakfast and lunch that they can take home on their remote days as well. So again, kind of same similar systems working out, we've been able to, to um, get that going. So right now in terms of our next steps, uh, now that we have all of the final uh, selections from families, we're going through the process with our HR, um, an operations team to make sure that we have the desks out the desks and the tables that we need. Um, in terms of the classrooms, we'll do the very same process that we did with hybrid. So we will look at the students who are returning, um, you know, try to minimize any disruption to uh, an assigned teacher, um, you know, for a student. And we did a good job with that last time. I anticipate we'll be able to do that well this time as well. Um, and, you know, I, one thing that we did when we went to the hybrid model, we were reaching out to families and, you know, really explaining the model. I'm hoping that 
you know, we'll have uh, families who will um, feel comfortable, you know, coming back in, you know, as the year progresses. Because we did see that happen also with um, when we're in hybrid. And if that does happen, we have enough space to make, you know, needed adjustments in the classrooms. Um, but that's something that you know, we'll continue to, to message. And then um, last, we will have information on our summer enrichment plan. I will be presenting that at the April 6th board meeting that will be happening um, on Tuesday so that um, all families and stakeholders know what we have planned uh, for the summer for students. So that concludes uh, the update on where we are as we get ready to return again next week, the, in our MDAU students our students in our options program and our students in CTE classes will start their five day um, of instructional model um, for next week. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Liz, I have a couple of questions. So the first of all, um, for the students who are switching to hybrid who haven't been in the buildings yet, is there going to be any kind of orientation meeting for them, even if it's their first day when they first show up? Yes, that will be in the plan uh, for those families. And we did the orientations a couple of different ways. Uh, some, some families wanted them just to be virtual. They just wanted to kind of see you know, through a video or camera um, what it looked like. Um, for others, and principals have continued to do this. They have families come in and walk the building so that they're kind of familiar and comfortable with that piece. But for those those uh, students who have not been in at all, they will also have a transition so they understand the protocols and procedures. Okay, and then I had a question about the rapid test kits. Um, how will those be used? I know you said something about they would be used at home, but will they also be used for sports or if somebody would get ill in the building or with any of our staff or bus drivers? Just curious well, about that. Yeah, so the test kits are can really be accessible to anyone who wants them. So that can be staff, that can be students, um, you know, if a student gets ill or if a family member, you know, if a family just wants a kit, they just want to make sure as a, another assurance too as well. So it's really designed as another mitigation strategy, you know, mm -hmm. another level of, um, you know, safety for, for families. So it's, it's accessible. And I'm trying to, Again, we're really trying to work on making this also a community resource as well. So anyone, okay. you know, just like at the libraries, you can pick up, they're the same tests that the libraries have recently shared that they have for families. They're the same, you know, for community okay. same tests. Yeah. Okay. And then my last question is parent-teacher conferences are coming up. Um, I know I haven't received any information yet as a parent in the high school. I think maybe some of the elementaries have, but I'm just wondering if those are going to be virtual again or in person. And if that information is coming pretty soon for us. Um, that it will be virtual. Signups have occurred already. So um, if you have not signed up, I'll need to follow up to find out why you don't have that information. Um, okay. Ms. Gould, I don't know, do you want to, if you have an update to share um, in terms of that, but that information went out a while ago. Okay, um, interesting, because I'm not the only high school parent who hasn't gotten something. I have another friend who said they didn't get anything either. So I don't know if the high school information, we missed it somehow, it didn't go out yeah. or what, but no, just curious well, about that. We can check back on that, um, Superintendent Kirby, but the information went out uh, in March, and it's also posted on the website. Okay, thank you. That. All right, thanks. That's all my questions. Thank you. Okay. I have a couple. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to hear that we're going to get an update on the summer enrichment programs on the April 6th. When we did the walkthroughs, there was some concern about the furniture in the buildings because apparently a lot of the furniture was moved away. And some of that I actually went to right at school. Mm -hmm. Are we going to make sure that they're going to have enough furniture too for their program? Yeah, we, we've been in conversation with them. I mean, this will be kind of a, a puzzle that we're working in the district to move furniture here, furniture there to meet the needs of all the programs. So we've been in conversation with them um, on what we need because they have some of the materials that they've been using we need for the spacing in the classrooms. And we're also working with some other districts who may be um, uh, donating some furniture that they, they, won't, they won't need right now because, you know, people have different 
um, configurations they're using to assist that we can also perhaps make available for writer school too as well. So that's the logistic. We're a logistical piece we've been working on um, the past several days through last week. Also, I heard the word flexibility in your uh, communications to us. I mean, I think it was very helpful that everybody was really, really flexible when we went back um, initially. I'm kind of hopeful that we're going to have that same flexibility for parents with this five-day model. Um, also, in our tours, it was pretty apparent when talking to principals and even teachers that subsets of our kids really, really needed to get back in the classroom to you know, mm -hmm. start getting ahead. And I know there needs to be some personal reach out to some of these folks. Is that occurring or will that occur? Yeah, that's already started. The, this, the schools have um, you know, maintained specific um, processes to identify students that we know the in-person supports are going to really support them academically. So they've made those, they, they are having and have had those conversations with those students. Um, and for the most part, those students are returning. There are still some families we have to continue to talk to um, just because they have different situations that, that uh, may make it challenging to come back five days a week right now, but we'll continue those conversations. Yeah. Those lists actually started, you know, the schools have been tracking students from the start of the year. So we've been pretty clear on who those kids are. Um, and, uh, and so now and we have seen a positive impact of students being back hybrid. So um, between that and um, now having even more time to offer, um, that should be really helpful for addressing the needs of those students. But yes, that has been a part of the of the plan. And the you know teachers, social workers, counselors, principals um, have been uh, work reaching out. That's good to hear. Um, also, I have a question about masks and barriers. You know, these are the barriers that are on desks um, with the sort of window panes. So I'm under the impression we're not going to change the mask policy at this time. The mask. Policy as written stands. Correct. I, I know we're all getting a little excited and feel we may not need to be wearing masks, but I think really when it comes to being in the classroom, we are still sticking with our existing yeah. mask policy. But, Correct. So the barriers, you know, I've heard feedback from actually a number of teachers. And funny thing is really not our teachers, but like teachers in Shaker. Um, who have kids in our school district, there is a concern that the barriers are um, difficult to teach in. And they were advocating for us to have a policy that would let um, the staff in a particular room pick and choose if they wanted a barrier um, around children. So I'm not asking for actually a response for that, but just a consideration at this point. I mean, is that valid? Is it not valid? Um, is it something we should be considering? I know in the walkthroughs, it was pretty apparent that those barriers were pretty small or pretty large. So the smaller the child, it's kind of hard for the kids to actually see through the barriers or look around the barriers, which would mm -hmm. force kids to get up and maybe sit on a radiator or something just to be able to see the front of the classroom. With more kids in the room, this seems like it's going to be a little bit more challenging. So maybe when you give it your next update, can you give that some thought and just sort of, you know, maybe reply about that? Well, yeah, and I can also tell we have also heard the feedback about the barriers. So I know that George and his team are looking at some different seating. One of the challenges is that the primary kids are shorter. So like this, even the bear, like it's just a little off. So trying to come up with a solution so that kids do have a greater visibility um, with those barriers. Now, I hesitate at this point to, to take barriers down, those types of things, because we have communicated to parents that this is, you know, one of our protective measures. And so sure. what, what we'll do is, you know, find some workarounds, maybe with the seating to help it to, you know, help it become more accessible for kids. Okay. I mean, I, I know there's still stuff that has to get figured out. Yeah. So um, any other questions, thoughts from anybody? Yeah, I, I also just wanted to sort of chime in about the rapid test kits. I'm, I'm really thrilled about this, um, that we 
uh, joined in this, this effort and accepted these uh, rapid test kits. I think that this is an opportunity for us to, um, you know, just continue to double down on our role within the community as a, you know, a positive agent for moving the entire community forward. Um, and that is really just wonderful. So thank you for pursuing that, Liz, and making those available and, and putting us in a position to help the community at large. Um, and then I also wanted to, just while we're talking about um, compliance issues, I really want to give a shout out to Joe D'Amato. Um, yesterday was the season opener uh, for baseball that I was that I attended, and um, Joe was there enforcing the uh, COVID mandates, and I personally witnessed him really um, getting an earful earful. Uh, from a visiting parent who did not want to wear a mask. And, um, you know, it was an unfortunate moment. I felt bad for Joe. Um, right. Not an easy time for him to, to do his job, but he did it. And uh, he basically told the parent that it was their choice to put on a mask or to leave the event. And, um, you know, so I just, you know, it was a tough moment for him and it was, it was reassuring, I think, for all of us to know that these um, precautions uh, are still being taken seriously, even when it's inconvenient. So um, yeah. just sharing that for the, for the point of it. Thank you. Well, well thanks, Liz. If there's no other question, can we move on to our next um, item, which is the policy uh, item? Yes, yeah. I'll turn it over to Dr. Lombardo. Hold it up here. Oh, All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, no action is needed on this item, but we do have to recognize that we have the second reading of our Title IX policy, 2266 non-discrimination on the basis of sex and education programs or activities. So again, this would be the second reading. Our uh, third and final reading will come April 6th uh, next week. Can I ask a question about this? Sure, go ahead, Dan. Thank you, um, Dr. Lombardo. I reread it, I skimmed it the first time and, and I put a little bit more time to it this week. Um, a lot of, uh, well, repeatedly throughout the, the policy, third party vendors are mentioned. Um, and it made me curious, um, you know, because we have a lot of third party um, providers. Uh, you know, we have people who come in and do this sort of programming after school and that sort of thing. Um, how exactly are they informed of uh, all of the policies? Uh, that we operate under? Are they just directed to our policy handbook online or how are they informed basically? How do they know what our policies are around these things? Yeah, um, uh, it would be on our website and directed to where our policies are. Um, as a district, we have to make an extra effort you know, based on this policy to make sure that people are aware as they use our buildings, as they come into the buildings. Um, so that's going to be a, another effort of this policy is to make sure that people understand um, this policy as well as our others. Can we add language to this policy that just makes what uh, Dan has shared just a part of our process? Yes, we can. Third part of it. So we'll add, add language around that. That way we can uh, make sure it's codified. Yeah, it seems to make sense that when people register with us to provide any sort of, of um, programming or, or what have you, I'm sure that there is a, you know, there's things that they need to fill out, et cetera. And I just think that this is one of those check boxes that we need to add, make sure that we add and that they recognize receipt of. Yes, thank you. Paul, on the bottom of page 21, there's a drafting note. It's not quite on the bottom, but close to the bottom. It looks like there's supposed to be some checks and some boxes within a certain, where a, a complaint would be submitted within a certain number of days. And I think the intent is five days. 
but I'm not sure the checkbox is in the right spot. Or actually it says five, it's not a checkbox. Or maybe I'm misreading it. Or the drafting note just goes away because it's written. The drafting note would, I'll double check, but a lot of the time uh, restraints are, are optional. Um, as we work through legal with this, um, um, sometimes depending on the investigation, those timelines do change. But I'll make a note on here when I bring it back for the third reading on, uh, on this particular one. I see what you're talking about. So the goal is to have the third reading for this policy on April 6th. Then also on April 6th, you have a book of policies that we'll be doing the first reading on. Is that correct? Correct. So we'll actually have three different readings. You may recall policy group A, those seven policies. We're in the That's final right. reading. So you'll have the final reading of those on April 6th. You'll have the final reading of this uh, policy, Title IX, 2266. And then there'll be the first reading of, um, of those 14 policies. Many of the policies were altered based on this Title IX policy. So yes, that'll be the first reading for those 14. And then in May, you'll get another set of policies for a first reading to be taken through a three reading process. Okay. Uh, any other questions from anybody? No other agenda items? No other agenda items. Mr. Gaynor, can I have a, um, no, can I have a motion to adjourn? My motion, we adjourn. I second. Mr. Gaynor, would you call the roll? Mr. Wright. Yes. Mr. Bosch. Yes. Mr. Hines. Yes. Ms. Fruity. Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll see you on April 6th. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Thanks, everyone.